And can you check with the microphone if you can hear me? Yeah, it's, yeah, just check with that. Um, sorry, earphone, not microphone. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so we'll get started with uh, today's lecture and we are going to talk about mathematical modeling. Uh, this is something that I'm pretty sure you have done in almost every class that you have taken so far, but I have to do it nonetheless. Okay. The idea of mathematical modeling is you have a system and you want to understand the physical dynamics of that particular system, okay? And usually the dynamics equation would come from physical principles, so conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, Kirchhoff's law, and things like that. In the, con well, in the context of electricity and circuits, of course, Kirchhoff's law uh, allows you to build mathematical models for how the current or the voltage potential difference across several nodes is and what the current flow across several nodes is, okay? So, one of the famous uh, quote from a statistician, and I'm blanking on his name, uh, but it was written in his paper in 1976. The famous quote is, all models are wrong, but some are useful, okay? So, no matter what you do, you cannot accurately capture the dynamics of the system using the models that you have made. Nonetheless, the hope is that you will design a control system around that particular nominal model that you have created, and hopefully that system, that controller, will have some sort of robustness property, so even if your model is slightly mismatched, it will still serve as a good controller for that particular system. Okay? So, I want to start with theorem. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay, keep that in the back of your mind. So, most electric circuits are made up of well, they are made up of, nowadays they are made up of a lot of things, but generally in, uh, we would consider RLC circuit in this particular class. So this is a resistor. The potential difference V of T across a resistor is equal to R, the current flow. So this is I of T and this is V of T. Okay, so the potential difference across a uh, resistor is V equals IR, the famous equation. Now, if you have a capacitor and the current through the capacitor is I of T, then and V of T is the potential difference, then the dynamics is C dV over dt, and you can equivalently write it as one over C And then we have inductor. This is L I of T, V of T, and the governing dynamics is 
v of t equals l di over dt or i of t is equal to okay okay so i gave you a resistor i asked you what the governing dynamics of that particular resistor is you took it to your to a lab and you plotted you passed some current through the resistor and then you figured out what the potential difference is using a potentiometer and then you plotted the graph and then you realize that okay v of t is equal to the resistor in ohm multiplied by the current okay and then i gave you a capacitor again you did the same thing you went to a lab you passed some current through it looked at the potential difference and roughly you figured out that okay i of t the current passing through the capacitor is equal to c multiplied by the derivative of the potential difference so which equivalently means that the potential difference is 1 over c integral of the current through the capacitor okay and you did the same thing for the inductor so that's how you create a model so you went to a lab you did some testing you figured out what the input output properties of that particular system is and you came up with some dynamical equation that captures the behavior of that particular system now the next goal is i want to interconnect these different pieces of uh, components so i want to put a resistor and an inductor together in some circuit so let's consider a current source this is my resistor this is my inductor and now this is your input so now this is your system this is your this so this rl circuit is your system the it is the input to the system and the vt is the output to the system and i want to find what the value of vt is what the dynamics governing dynamical equation for this particular circuit is okay so how will we do that we'll apply kirchhoff's law right so this is i1 this is i2 and we know that i1 t plus i2 of t is equal to i of t because the current whatever is the input current at this node is also equal to the output current at that particular node i know that v of t is equal to r i1 t and i also know that v of t is equal to l di2 over dt so i have three equations and i have three unknowns what are the three unknowns here can someone tell me what are the three unknowns here yes i1 i2 and v of t yes i1 i2 and v of t so this is the input which we control so it's not unknown what the output is is unknown and of course 
these internal currents that is going to pass through the resistor and inductor, that is something that I don't know. So I1 and I2 are known as the internal states of the system, and they are very useful to know, but in many cases, it's not very useful to know them, okay? Especially for the purpose of this particular class, it's not important to know what I1 and I2 is, uh, but as you take higher and higher level of control classes, so 5551 and beyond, uh, the knowledge of internal states of the system would become more important because you want to create controllers that are much more sophisticated. Okay, so this class is not going to, well, this entire course 3551 is not going to go into very sophisticated control design techniques. But in the future, if you take higher level classes, these internal states will become useful. For this class, it's not. So let's try and eliminate I1 and I2 from the picture so that I can get the relationship between I of T and V of T. Uh, how will I do that? So let me rewrite this equation. So I2 of T is equal to 1 over L V of T dt. So I get V of T over R plus 1 over L integral 0 to T VT dt is equal to I of T. I have found out the governing dynamics of the system, the input output behavior of the system using Kirchhoff's law. Okay? So if it was a mass spring damper system, you would have used Newton's laws of motion. If it is an RLC circuit, you will use uh, Kirchhoff's law. Uh, and if it is op amp circuit, you will use similar techniques uh, and some approximations that are specific to op amps. You will use those ideas to derive the governing input output equation for the overall system. Any questions so far in this derivation? Okay. So far, we have just used elementary physics and the knowledge about these components to understand what the governing dynamics of the system is going to be like. The other important property that you may not notice of these systems is that they are linear systems, okay? So what does linear systems mean? So linear systems have very two very desirable properties. I have a system. I have an input. Let me call it u of t. And output, let me call it y of t. So in electrical engineering and more generally in controls, u of t is always used to denote input signal and y of t is used to denote the output signal. Okay, so, so linear systems satisfy two properties. The first property is superposition. This means that u1 plus u2 will yield y1 plus y2. Okay, that's the first important property of uh, linear systems. And the second important property is uh, homogeneity. Alpha u, 
alpha y. Alpha is some real number. Okay. So two properties of linear systems, if I add the inputs, the output gets added. If I scale the input, the output also gets scaled by the same factor. Okay. In contrast with this, there are nonlinear systems. For instance, y of t is equal to u square of t. Okay, it doesn't satisfy the superposition or homogeneity property. So this is a non-linear non system. Non-linear systems are extremely important in, uh, well, actually most physical systems are non-linear, right? Uh, there is saturation in electric circuits. Uh, Diode, it has a nonlinear behavior, right? Uh, it allows the electricity to pass through in one direction but doesn't allow the electricity to pass through in the other direction. So it has a nonlinear behavior. Uh, what else? Most biological systems are nonlinear in nature, okay? Airplanes, airplanes are also highly nonlinear systems. So if there are so many nonlinear systems in reality, why do we study linear systems? Any thoughts? It's easier to model. Easier to model and? Uh, I think we can use it as a basis for the nonlinear systems. Absolutely. So you can use it as a basis for developing controllers for nonlinear systems. Okay? And that's what is done in aircraft control. So aircrafts have maybe five or ten different configurations, so it's on the ground, it's climbing, it's descending, it's taking a right turn, it's taking a left turn, so these are like various configurations of an aircraft. Each configuration has specific dynamical equation associated with it, which are highly nonlinear. However, what people do, or what aircraft manufacturers do, they linearize the system around the nominal dynamics. What do I mean by that? So, so let's, let's, let's uh, go through this train of thought. So I get a nonlinear system. I want to design a controller. I know that there is a nominal dynamics, which is it's going to climb at 10,000 feet per minute or 5,000 feet per minute. That's the nominal dynamics. That's what we are going to see in most situations. It's not going to climb at 5,000 meters per minute. It's not going to climb at 1,000. Uh, meters per minute. It's going to climb at, let's say, 2,500 meters per minute, or maybe 3,000, maybe 2,700, 2,300. So 2,500 seems like the nominal system, so I'm going to linearize the system using Taylor series. I'm going to linearize the system around the nominal behavior, and then I'm going to design my controller for that particular linear system, and I'm going to implement that linear system, a uh, linear controller, or the controller that I've designed for that linear system, I'm going to implement it on an aircraft. And then I'm going to pray to the God that this should work and nobody should die. Okay? And this is exactly what happened. So that's how we are able to fly such long distances because over the past hundred or so years, people have had a very good idea of what kind of uh, controllers would work in different situations through trial and error and through modeling and through linearizing and figuring out robustness properties of controllers and uh, that has allowed us to travel safely from point A to point B. So that's why we study linear systems. So now I want to convey the concept of linearization around the nominal dynamics. So let's uh, talk about linearization. So 
So let's say yt is a function of some signal xt and I know that xt is roughly equal to x0 plus some small error. What should I call it? x bar t. Okay. So I have a nonlinear system. I give it a signal xt and I get the output y of t. I want to linearize the system. Then y of t is x naught plus epsilon x bar of t. So x naught is the 2500 meters per minute x bar of t is whatever error you may have when you are actually flying the aircraft. Taylor series, okay? Taylor series comes to our rescue. And I get the expression. What should the expression be? f of x naught plus epsilon del f over del x one. Uh, this x one is the, so let me write x, x one to x n. So I used x naught here, but this x naught is a vector. Uh, should I change it to something else so that you don't confuse between this zero and this one to n, what should I use? Let me use E or N, nominal value, N. Okay, so epsilon, the first derivative of F with respect to X1 evaluated at N multiplied by x bar 1t plus epsilon del f over del xn. Oh, n is also used. What should I use? Eta. x bar nt. Okay, so this comes from Taylor series expansion. Questions? How many of you agree with this equation? Everyone? <laughs> okay, so this is the Taylor series expansion. You differentiate f with respect to x1, multiply it with the error term, the first element of the error term and so on, and you add all these equations and you get the first order Taylor series expansion of the function, the nonlinear function f around the nominal value n. So this is just a constant because eta is a constant. And I can replace epsilon x1 bar by x minus x of t minus eta. So, or x1 of t minus eta. So what I have is f of eta plus x of t, x1 of t minus eta 1 Okay, and that's the linearized input output equation of the nonlinear system. Are you able to see it? No? That's okay. Oh, uh, sorry. 
That's all right. I'm, it's just, you will have the video later on okay. too. Thank you. Uh, that's that's bad. Okay. Okay. So now, if I scale x1 of t, if I add to x1 and x2 of t, y of t will get added. If I scale x1 of t, well, eta will also have to be scaled appropriately. Then y of t will also get scaled in an appropriate fashion. OK? So that's why we study linear systems. Because every nonlinear system can be linearized around the nominal value. And then we can design the controller for this particular linear system. OK? And hope that it's it works perfectly or rather robustly in the nonlinear system as well. Any questions so far? Yes. This? This Xn? The vector itself. So this vector you are talking about? Yeah. yeah. Oh no. So this 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 x is. Uh, so I'm just showing that this particular signal is a multi-dimensional signal. It's not a. It's not a scalar signal. Okay. So this i t that you have seen here, it's a scalar signal. It's just one current, right? But here, you could have multiple sources of currents in a nonlinear system, right? So that's what we are trying to approximate here. Okay. Yes? Would you use more than just the first order Taylor series? No, because then it will become a nonlinear system. Mm. So if you use the second order Taylor series, you will have the second derivative here, and this term will be squared of xn minus eta n. Uh, and then it will become a nonlinear system because yt depends nonlinearly non on xn or x1 or x2. So, so we don't use second order Taylor series, we just use first order Taylor series. Any other question? No. Now let's check whether the superposition and homogeneity, does it, is it satisfied in this particular system? Uh, let me take, I have V1 of T over R plus 1 over L integral of 0 to T. I have two signals, input-output equations. I add the two. OK, so I feed the input signal I1 of t I get the dynamical equation is v1 of the dynamical equation for v1 of t is given by this expression. Same thing if I feed i2 of t to that particular circuit, this is what the output is going to look like. I add the two inputs and I see what happens to the output. What I get is v1 of t plus v2 of t over r. is equal to i1 plus i2 of t, OK? Which implies that if I feed i1 plus i2 to this RL circuit, I'm going to get v1 plus v2 as output. 
because it satisfies the dynamical equation for this particular circuit. Same thing if I multiply alpha to the input. So I'm going to show it right here. If I multiply alpha here, it satisfies the expression and therefore with input i of t, alpha i of t, the output will be alpha v of t. So therefore it satisfies both the superposition as well as homogeneity property required for us calling it a linear system. Okay, so so far what we have done is we have realized that okay using basic physics, basic conservation laws, I can derive input output equations for any system that is given to me. If I get a linear system, if I get the input output equation that looks like a equation for a linear system, that's great because then we are in the linear systems domain, we don't have to do anything fancy. However, if it turns out to have a nonlinear dynamics, as is the case for aircrafts, rocket, Mars rover, so on and so forth, you have to linearize the dynamics and you use Taylor series first order expansion to linearize the dynamics. And then you get yourself back into the linear systems domain. Okay. Now linear systems satisfy two very desirable properties the property of superposition and the property of homogeneity and that will come to our rescue when we start designing controllers. But before we do that, we need to come up with a method so that analyzing the linear systems, especially the input output behavior of a combination of linear systems becomes much easier. So let's, let's see what I'm saying, okay? Let's, let's try to, again, take this example and try to solve this particular equation, okay? This is a differential equation, I can solve it. Let's try and solve it. So this is a brief recap of uh, what you did in signals and systems. So the way to solve that differential equation is I first solve V0 T over R plus okay. I need to get V0 of T by solving this differential equation. And then I get V of T as integral zero to t, v zero tau, i of t minus tau, d tau. This is the convolution operator. V zero convolves with i evaluated at t. Okay, so if I give you uh, a question, it is a step input, step current input, what's the V of t? Uh, in examination, you will not feel happy about it because you'll have to first solve this and then find this convolution, which is a difficult integral to do. So we all want to come up with simple way of evaluating this convolution and what's one method to do it, which you guys have studied in signals and systems? Laplace transform, right? If I take the Laplace transform on both the ends, what I get is Laplace transform of V naught multiplied by Laplace transform of 
i okay so convolution in time domain is multiplication in laplace domain right all of you remember that from signals and systems Okay, so now if I interconnect several systems one after another, so this is my system one, this is my system two, this is my system three, and I give it an input u of t, I want to find the output y of t. If I were doing this calculation in time domain, I have to find v naught and then do a convolution this signal is an input to S2, so I again have to figure out V0 for the second system, convolve it with the input, which is this Harry equation, and do the same thing for S3, and then get the value of Yt. Very complicated. I don't want to do it. Okay? Too much work. I am lazy. Okay? I'm guessing you are also lazy because you are in control systems class. Uh, so we have to come up with a better way of evaluating this input output behavior. And I'm going to use Laplace transform. So what I will get is Laplace transform of y is equal to some transfer function of g3, the transfer function of g2, the transfer function of g1, multiplied by the Laplace transform of q0. So I just have to multiply several equations or several uh, functions of uh, S, and I'm going to get the output signal pretty quickly. So let's do a quick recap of what Laplace transform is. Yes? This? Uh, this is G, G3, G2, G1, and L of U0. So let F, which is from 0 minus to infinity to R, be a signal such that integral of ft dt absolute value 0 minus to infinity for some sigma 1 greater than 0. So f is a signal, it's a function of time. It's integrable, but you need to decay the time axis, okay? So you need to decay it with an exponential term, where sigma, is, sigma 1 is some positive number. Then you can define the Laplace transform L of f, which is denoted by capital F of s as integral of e raised to minus st, ft, dt, and this time goes from 0 minus to infinity.
okay now this s you cannot pick this s so s is a complex number but you cannot pick s arbitrarily because this integral may be infinity if you don't pick s wisely so what is the domain of convergence so this is my complex plane this is my sigma 1 which is on the positive real real line and so i can pick s anywhere here okay i pick s anywhere here and i try to evaluate this integral i'll get a function of s and it will be well defined it won't blow up it won't go to infinity it won't go to minus infinity it will be well defined okay so that's the laplace uh, Laplacian of the signal f and it has a domain of convergence. The cool thing is that this operation is invertible. Okay, so what does that mean? I can actually compute inverse Laplace transform which whose formula comes from some uh, sophisticated complex analysis techniques which we won't go into but L inverse of F is given by one over two pi j sigma minus j infinity sigma plus j infinity e raised to st fs ds okay this is the inverse laplace transform Okay, I want you to pause. I want you to pause here and think. What does it imply? So sigma is greater than sigma one here. So I pick a line in this domain of convergence. Let me use a different color. I pick a line. I start here. So the function f is of course defined everywhere in the complex, well at everywhere on in this side of the complex plane. So I start from here, integrate the function all the way to plus infinity. So this is sigma plus j infinity. Start integrating it and I recover the original signal back. <coughs> okay. which means, which implies that by taking Laplace transform, I have not lost any information about the signal, okay? Not a single bit of information is lost when I take the Laplace transform. That's a very, very important property because if you come up, let's say you, tomorrow you have some great idea, some crazy idea, and you come up with some transform where you lose some amount of information in the process. You cannot actually build theory around it because as you start cascading more and more systems, you will start losing a lot of information about the input, okay? So that's why Laplace transform is very important because it doesn't lose any information about the signal when you go from the signal domain to the Laplace domain because you can always do the inversion and uh, extract the original signal that you started with, okay? Does that make sense? Any question? Yes. Um, I'm still a little confused what you did over here uh, to uh, know what you can choose for S um, and then also how you retrieve the oh, so, uh, so look at this expression, okay? So what this says is, so this is a real number. This is a real number. In fact, this is non-negative real number. This is a real number. 
and I integrate it, and it turns out to be finite. If I define this in such a manner that s is on this side of the plane, so on this side of sigma 1, it means that the real part of s is greater than sigma 1, which means you are suppressing the signal. So this is, what is this term trying to do? It is trying to suppress the signal, right? So you are suppressing the signal even more because now your sigma is greater than sigma 1. And at sigma 1, this was finite, so you are suppressing the signal more, so it has to be finite also. And therefore, this integral is well defined. Okay? If this was going to infinity, this integral is not well defined because it might be infinity. Okay? And then also, the, um, can you re explain how we managed to invert it? Invert using well, the you know, this, this formula comes from, uh, well, I don't know whether you studied this formula in signals and systems or not. It's part of the syllabus. So you should have seen it before. But it actually comes from some <coughs> integration techniques in complex numbers. So that's not part of this class. In, in the sense that it, it's more involved. It's called Cauchy integral. You have to spend some time building that theory, and then you can understand what that integral means. Okay. The important thing from an engineering perspective is through this transform, you haven't lost any information about the signal. Now, why is that true? That comes from complex numbers. So that's something that if you take a class in math on complex numbers, you will understand why this is true. OK, any other question? Yes? I guess while you did draw a straight line there, is it really you get the original signal just from the straight line? Or you just integrate it going all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. So you have to integrate it. And then you get the original signal. I mean, let's, let's try and unravel this equation a little bit more. What you have is 1 over 2 pi j, uh, integral of from minus infinity to plus infinity, e raised to sigma e raised to minus j omega t sigma, well, f of sigma uh, let me use j theta here. So then I have sigma plus j theta d theta with a j somewhere here. Okay, so you're essentially carrying out. So this j, of course, cancels with this j. Uh, the 2 pi disappears once you do the integral. And this is precisely what the integral would mean. Okay, so you have a j here, so you can express this as cos of j, cos of theta t plus j sine of theta t. Uh, Okay, and so then you can just carry, so this will be a complex number, uh, but you can decompose it into cos omega term and then sine omega term, right? Uh, and then you can carry out the integral just like you would do normally. Okay, except that you will have integration with cos terms and sine terms and then cross terms, cos multiplied by sine and sine multiplied by cos. That's exactly how you recover the original signal. And that is what the meaning of integrating from sigma minus infinity to sigma plus infinity is. As long as the sigma is greater than sigma 1. OK? Any other question? All right, so I'm, uh, that ends the class. We'll meet again on Monday. Uh, and we'll continue our discussion on Laplace transform and transfer functions.